Good morning. Hey, it's so great to see everyone this morning. You guys excited to eat some chili here in just a little bit? Oh, yes. Please try. I know it's very distracting. It smells amazing in here. I'm going to try and keep your attention here for just a little bit, and then uh, we're going to enjoy some time all together. Uh, my name is Jacob. I'm the worship director here, and uh, it's so great uh, to have such an amazing team, be able to step off for a week and um, uh, be able to speak. Can we give it up for the worship team playing this morning? Such a great job. Um, I'm always honored to share. The first time I shared was on a flannel Sunday. Uh, so uh, it's becoming a routine or something like that. So um, it's good to be up here in a flannel. I've got quite the dad bod going on, not going to lie. So a little bit of grace helps. Um, it's, it's always such a beautiful thing to share the Word of God um, with the community that, that you do life with. So it's just such a beautiful blessing to be able to, to be here and do that. I believe strongly um, that it's going to be a morning where we receive life, uh, joy, excitement for the future, and peace in our community. So Neil, thanks so, so much for letting me speak. Uh, this morning I want to share about proximity to Jesus. Jesus is our Lord our teacher, our Messiah, our King, our closest friend, and many other things. He's so good to us. He's so trustworthy, and he invites each and every one of us to be just as close to him. I want to start about a story about having proximity to my dad. In third grade, I remember my dad was our substitute teacher at our private school that we went to, and I think it was the uh, one and only time that I've ever seen him uh, be a substitute teacher. Uh, he was a uh, works as an engineer in the foundry industry for most of his life, so a bit of a, a career shift for a day, but hey, duty calls, right? Um, I remember we took a, ma- a math test that day, so at least that was, you know, there was that for him, uh, being the math whiz that he is, being an engineer, something to relate to. So it was a pretty easy day, I suppose, for him, third grade. Um, I remember being confused about a question on the test, and so I kind of got stumped on it, and I went up to the teacher's desk, and I was like, I don't understand this question, and um, he it was trying to like reword the question for me to be able to explain it, and I was like, okay, so I sat back down and tried to figure it out, and then I, I couldn't figure it out, so I moved on, did the rest of the test, came back to it, and like, I guess maybe... Maybe this is the answer. And like, guys, I know this isn't life-changing news. It was a third grade math test, so it's not like I was trying to solve the world's problems. But at the time, it was really stumping me. But anyways, I filled in the answer, and then uh, after the test, I was done with it. I turned it in at the front, like you do. And then I went to the teacher, and I asked him, I was like, so like, what was the answer to that question? And he broke it down for me. And showed me like how to get to the answer, and I was like, "Oh, duh, I get it." Like, thanks, math whiz. And so I proceed to go back to where I turned in my test and pick it up because now I get the answer. So I'm gonna, you know, fill in the right answer, right? And then he quickly corrected me. He's like, "No, you already turned in the test. That's why I'm telling you how to do it now. You've already filled that out. You know, I'm not just giving you the answer so you can cheat." So. Uh, I just forgot where we were. We weren't at home. And my dad was very uh, gracious as far as uh, doing things over and over again. We used to do Frisbee golf, and I got a hole in, wall, uh, hole in one once, and that was after the fifth try of standing in the same spot. So um, we played our best hand. So, so he, he, I was kind of a little used to trying things again and again, but I forgot. He was the substitute teacher at the school, and I was a student. Just kind of forgot where I was. And I'm done with the message. That was it. So I hope you enjoyed the story. Here's how it relates. Sometimes we can confuse who Jesus is in our lives based off our proximity to him. At the Last Supper, John and Judas had the same proximity to Jesus. They were sitting on either side of him, but their hearts were in completely different places. Jesus lived a very real life, with a very real body and very real disciples. 
John and Judas, they both partnered with Jesus in the ministry that he had those past three years. They slept where he slept, they walked where he walked, but their outcomes were radically different from each other, John John and uh, Judas. So we're going to look at where these two ended up, and then we're going to backtrack a little bit in Scripture to maybe see a little bit of how they could have gotten there. Does that sound good this morning? All right. All three of us, we're going for it. In John 13... I know you all are just just sticking around for the chili, so just, just be nice. In John 13, Jesus has the 12 disciples around him at the Last Supper and is explaining to them that one of them is going to portray him. So let's read, starting in verse 18. I'm not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the, this passage of Scripture. He who shared my bread has turned against me. I'm telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very truly I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, Very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which we've been discovering is John, this whole book, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. I just think it's a funny picture. Peter's like, you ask him. Just sit next to him, you ask him. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. As soon as Jesus took the bread, Satan entered into him. So Jesus told him, What you are about to do, do quickly. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. Since Judas had charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the festival or to give something to the poor. All right, great job hanging in there. We've got some more scripture to go. Uh, It's a uh, scripture-dense message this morning, but um, we're going to be able to unpack some of these stories together. Here we see a clear divide between John's experience with Jesus and Judas' experience with Jesus. How could John be so bold to ask the question that he did? How could Judas be so filled with evil and have his heart be so distant from Jesus? The story starts a little bit earlier in the journey. Let's look at a couple of questions that created some defining moments for John and Judas. We're going to look back at Luke 9 and see an exchange that John had with Jesus. So in verse 51, As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And he sent messengers on ahead, who went into a Samaritan village to get things ready for him. But the people there did not welcome him, because he was heading for Jerusalem. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they asked, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven and destroy them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. Then he and his disciples went on to another village. Well, that's embarrassing. First off, I would like to point out something funny. At least it's funny to me. Uh, Like I said earlier, we've been discussing that it says in the book of John, which John wrote, uh, that he refers to himself as the one that Jesus loved, the disciple that Jesus loved. I just think it's a little ironic we're finding this passage here in, in the book of Luke. So he didn't really necessarily maybe want to write about his embarrassing story in his own book of John. So uh, that was in Luke 9 uh, that we find the story about John and James getting corrected by Jesus. Now, for context on this passage, earlier in Luke 9, earlier in that chapter, the disciples had all just been equipped with the Holy Spirit's power and authority 
of signs and wonders. And they were told to go from town to town proclaiming the good news. And they were told to shake the dust off of their feet whenever a town rejected them. And also right before we see this passage happen, starting in verse 51, right before that, Peter, James, and John had just seen Jesus transfigured into his glory on the mountain. So it's easy to assume that maybe James and John were a little amped up going into this Samaritan village. Shake the dust off our feet. Do you know who you're talking to? Let's, we're the sons of thunder. Let's take the up a notch. Let's call fire down from heaven. As a boss or an employee, a parent, a student, have you ever had a do you know who you're talking to kind of a moment? Yeah, if we're honest with ourselves, probably yes. Sometimes we can get so caught up in what we're doing that we forget who we're doing it for. Jesus quickly rebuked James and John. They'd gotten so focused on what they had been called to do that they lost sight of the people that Jesus was inviting them to have a heart for. I want to pause here for just a moment. Have you ever found yourself there? I certainly have. Asking God, but God, isn't this what you've called me to do? When we lose sight of why we're called and who called us, we'll find ourselves making unnecessary messes. There's an invitation here, and it's real simple. We focus on Jesus. Let him handle the outcome. I'm preaching to myself here. And that's what John did. He remembered the whole reason why they were going from town to town. All right, so let's see how Judas handles correction instead. In John 12. Oh, hey, look, we're back in the book of John. John's documenting someone else getting put on blast. John 12, verse 3. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. You know, nard, it's a common word. As you do. She poured it out on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. As you do. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to whatever was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Did you know that Jesus is an advocate for our hearts? He knows our motivations. He knows the questions we're going to ask, why we ask them. He is so trustworthy. Even when it seems like no one around us understands, like Mary might have felt with the pint of perfume, Jesus knows. And isn't that just so comforting to know? In both passages, Jesus spoke into the situations addressing the heart of the matter, not the heart of the questioner. We can ask Jesus questions. In fact, we're encouraged over and over again to ask and keep asking for wisdom, for God to show up, for his kingdom to be on earth as it is in heaven. The thing with God knowing our hearts is that he loves us enough not to leave us stuck where we are, having hard hearts. Judas didn't have his heart in the right place. He didn't ask out of a genuine place, but out of greed. And when we aren't right with Jesus in our heart, he always shows us a way out, the way back to his heart. In both cases of John and Judas, as Jesus corrected, he put out an invite. No, we're not going to call fire down from heaven. We're going to move on to the next town and show them the good news that they can claim for themselves. No, we're not going to focus on what the money from the perfume could have been used for. 
We're going to applaud this woman's heart because she gets it. She gets it. This is all about me. Not the mission, not the giftings, not the influence or the power, but access to me and the love I have for anyone willing to receive it. That's what we see John taking a hold of at the Last Supper. He had access to everything that was Jesus. He embraced Jesus correcting him when he wasn't thinking straight, and that actually led him to a closer relationship with Jesus. He used his closeness with Jesus to ask him secrets of the kingdom. Judas didn't take the opportunity to change. Instead, he used his closeness in proximity to Jesus for personal gain and power. Now, these may seem like really dramatic examples with really dramatic outcomes, but the seeds planted in either receiving redirection and healing from Jesus or not has deep implications for each and every one of us. We are all faced with this in different seasons of life, and we can choose to let Jesus change our hearts and receive life from him. Another thing that I would love to note is Jesus is the best at this. Amen? He's 100% batting average, knows our heart. He knows how to word it into our hearts. But sometimes Jesus uses a friend, a boss, a relative, or dare I say it, even a pastor to help redirect us when we feel stuck in our own lane and forget the mission that's in front of us. We're going to reread John 13, 20. I don't think you're going to see it up there, so just I'm just going to read it through a couple of times. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me. And whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. I'm just going to read that one more time. Oh, nice. Very Thanks, Josh. Very truly, I tell you, whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one who sent me. I just want to stay on this for a minute. Did you know that Jesus uses pastors and the church to help bring life? I know this can be a, such a difficult hurdle, oftentimes with a lot of baggage and past hurts and assumptions. But there is so much life and encouragement on the other side of this hurdle. And I've been in church my whole life as I've moved around state to state um, when I was younger. And there's been a lot of challenging things that I've um, had the opportunity to receive or not. But what I've realized over time is it's just God saying, hey, I want you a little bit closer to my heart in this. And he wants us so close to his heart. People may come and go. Jobs may come and go. Seasons may come and go. But God wants us to ask him, where are you in this? Who are you using in my life to help me bring closer to you? God is always inviting us deeper into relationship with him. It's just what he does because he's so good. And life just keeps getting better and better with him. So in a few moments here, we're going to sing to Jesus. And as we sing, I just love each and every one of us to just pour out our hearts to the Lord. And everyone's included in this. There's no, I've got this all figured out club. And then like the rest of you better get it figured out. It's God is inviting each and every one of us to uh, just give our hearts to him, maybe a little bit more today. So this might be your first time as we're singing that you're just singing your heart out to the Lord. It might be your thousandth time, but the beautiful thing is that it never gets old. It's something that we get to do all the time with the Lord. And then one thing I just wanted to mention is maybe it seems like lately or maybe even for a long time, you've been hearing God say, do you know who you're talking to? But maybe we're just hearing it in the wrong tone. Yes, God is almighty and sovereign, and scriptures say that even the rocks are going to cry out his praises. 
But this morning, he wants us to hear him as a gentle father who loves us, saying, don't you know who you're talking to? I love you. I created you. I know what you need. I know what you have inside you. So maybe this morning, that's something that um, God's putting on your heart just to surrender back to him, just learning to trust him again. So I'd just love to invite the worship team to come up. And just whatever God's stirring on your heart, this is just a beautiful time just to respond through song to him, just in your chair where you are, um, just, okay, God, I trust you in this. I'm going to trust you in this. So if you wouldn't um, mind joining me, let's go ahead and stand. I'm going to pray. God, thank you so much for being so trustworthy. Thank you for a beautiful day. Just a beautiful new opportunity to be reminded of your goodness. Reminding us of this God that we can trust. We can trust you with our hearts. We can trust you with our lives. We can trust that the people that you've sent into our lives, that you're the one that sent them, that we can learn to trust bosses and pastors and teachers again, that ultimately, God, it's you. You're wooing us closer to your heart and um, God, if there's any hurdles that are just sitting in front of us that I mean, we've tried to jump over and we tripped and fell or uh, it just seems too high, God, would you just show us that you're bigger than, than any hurdle? You're such a big God, but you're so gentle and you're just whispering to us this morning, don't you know who I am? I created you. I love you. I have plans for you. I have uh, plans for your family, for your work, for your life. So we just invite you, Lord, to just to come into our hearts as we sing to you, as we worship. Thank you for a, a brand new day every day as an opportunity to just be filled with your life, not guilt or shame, not confusion or regret from the past, but yes, we can just step into your goodness right now. In our hearts, in our seats, as we're singing to you, God, we're just stepping into your goodness.